Hello, everybody. Good to meet you once again here at our Advent Life YouTube page. And um, I hope all of you are well. Our prayer list here in our community has been growing in the last few weeks. There are many reasons to give thanks. But then again, there are those who are um, needing help, needing prayer. So um, let's begin praying. All that we're talking about is prayer. Now, as we look to the end of the year, um, when there are people in need in our community, in our extended community, in Albuquerque and other portions of the country, family members, and, and yes, we need to pray. So let's pray together. Dear God, we know that you are the one who invites us to come to you as we open our mouths to pray. We know that you are at work. We know that you are already attending to those in need around us because you are good. So as we pray, Lord, we want to express once again our, our, our frustration, our grief, our, our anxiety. We want to place all of that at your feet, knowing that you experience the pain with us because you are a God of love. So please, Lord, bless those who need help, those who are getting sick because of COVID-19, and those who are lonely, bless the poor in our community. We have been trying to do as much as we can, but obviously we cannot do everything, so we rely on you and, and so many other people in this city that are doing beautiful and great things. Bless them as well as they do work for those who are out in the cold. And please, Lord, continue blessing us as we go out to bless others as well. So thank you, and may we be reminded of Jesus always, the one who wants to work through us for others. And in his name we pray, amen. So very good, my friends, let's go right to it. Um, we are talking about prayer in the last Sabbaths of this year. Now we're at the beginning of the month of December. We've made it thus far. And, um, and I decided to, to lead our community on a new journey here before the ending of the year. A journey through the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. A journey focused on prayer and what prayer looks like in real life. We are walking with a few biblical characters, learning from them, seeing God and the world through their eyes as they pray. So we are addressing the five first prayers, the first five prayers in the, book, in the Gospel of Luke. It's very interesting how the book is framed around the action of the Spirit and prayer. So last week we talked about the Fiat Mihi. Uh, Mary's prayer, let it be done to me according to your word. And today we're going to talk about the Magnificat. And from that word, you already know in the Latin, that we're talking about the beginning of the prayer again, when Mary is going to say, my soul magnifies the Lord. So yes, and as we're going through these stories, obviously, and these prayers, uh, my goal is to, to have a clear picture as to what prayer truly looks like in real life. How biblical characters experience this, this reality that we call prayer. So a few assumptions. Assumptions are ideas. They're, 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 they're conceptions that are clear to us when we go into prayer. So what are some of these ideas that we're now learning? And, and, and I hope that you at home, I'm, I'm certainly, I, I'm, I know for certain that in our community we have been applying these things in Thursday night prayer meeting and as we go about our personal prayer life, but I hope you at home, it's starting to become clear some of these assumptions and, 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 and their, you know, how they relate to prayer. The assumption number one that we saw last week is that God is at work even without our knowledge of it. He's already doing things. So being, coming to, to, to Him in prayer is 
is not exempt from that. We come not because we're initiating the process of prayer, but because we're already responding to His work, to His Word. And that's very important. Number two, apart from knowing that God is already at work and He is the one who initiates this whole movement, we, need, we realize that our response is not us desiring to do many things, but it's, it's, it's permission. Let it be done to us according to your word. Let your word be the guiding, the guiding motion as we go out and as we respond to prayer. It's a risk, really. Mary accepting the word of God, knowing that that would bring a lot of pain and a lot of trouble to her and to her family. Response is permission, and that comes with the realization that the will of God for Mary and for us and for everybody else is Jesus constantly being reminded that the will of God is, is truly manifested in Jesus. And, and our job really is just to realize that that is the case and then to allow, to permit the word that, that, that allow Jesus to be formed within Mary to be formed within us as well. Allowing Jesus to take over our life and how we are engaged in the world. Today we're going to cover two more assumptions from this prayer. So let's move forward in this narrative. The second prayer in the Gospel of Luke is a famous prayer, the Magnificat, which means, like I said, exalted, magnified words that will appear in the beginning of the prayer. The second prayer in the Gospel of Luke. So what can we learn about this prayer today? Let's pick up the story right where we left off last week. The angel visited Mary. She responded with the first prayer. Let it be to me according to your word. And now we keep reading on verse 39. And we're going to go down all the way to verse 55. So read with me Luke chapter 1 verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah. And greeted Elizabeth. And we talked about these two characters last week. They're the father and mother of John the Baptist. And God was already at work in their life even before Mary showed up into the picture. So she goes to, to their house. That's the next episode in this drama. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was already six months pregnant from what we learned last week with John the Baptist. So yeah, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So Elizabeth had this insight. The text tells us that, that the Holy Spirit came upon her, and she just didn't run out somewhere and scream. No, she, the Spirit coming gave her an, an insight into what was happening in the world, into the action of God in the world. So this is very interesting. We're not talking about the Holy Spirit specifically. We're talking about prayer, but it's interesting to pause and notice that the work of the Spirit is not to give us a little private experience with God, but it comes giving insight as to what is God is doing in the world. We talked about this with the sin against the Holy Spirit, that one of the symptoms of, not, of being disconnected to God is being unable to read the action of God in reality. So you can go back to the sermons on Matthew to check that out. But it's interesting to see this happening with Elizabeth. This Spirit comes upon her and suddenly she has insight. She sees the work of God in reality. Very important. So yes... For behold, verse 44, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And obviously it's interesting because John the Baptist and Jesus will meet up again and John will recognize him right out of the bat. That's how the Gospel of John begins. We saw that in Matthew 2. It's phenomenal. In blessed, verse 45, is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now comes Mary resp Mary's response, and here is the prayer of the Magnificat, which we'll study today. Verse 46, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked on the humble state of His servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, 
For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And last verse, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So there you go. Long prayer, longer than last week. Last week was just one, two verses. Now we have a broader prayer. And what can we learn from this prayer here? A lot of words, a lot of interesting things. If you were following along in the reading of the text, well, one of the thir- first things that becomes quite evident in this prayer is Mary's knowledge of the history and the expectations of Israel. The promises God had made in the past and were yet to be fulfilled. This prayer here is a little window into the heart and the mind of the people of Israel before the first coming of Jesus. Before the coming, the advent of Jesus. Every line in this prayer carries pieces of Old Testament texts that highlight the promises of God to Israel and that anticipate His future action. This is the dream of Israel at the, at the time. To see the things anticipated by the prophets happening in reality. And you can see that from the prayer. The prayer is, the, is an opening up, is an un, un, unveiling of the expectations of the people of Israel. That God would do a new thing. And that now that new thing was about to happen. Now, like I said, within this text here, this little prayer, there's a lot of quotations and ideas and allusions to Old Testament texts. So I chose just a few, just so you understand how Mary is very sensitive. She knows the history of Israel and the expectations of Israel concerning new actions of God. And I just wrote a few on the board. First one is this whole idea of, I magnify the Lord, right out of the beginning here, my soul magnifies the the Lord, for he has looked at the humble state of his servant, and then God raises up the humble. This is a clear allusion to Psalm chapter chapter 34, and I'll, I'll just try to read all these to you, just so you can have a little glimpse of what's happening. The Psalms are the hymn book of Israel. They sang these Psalms. They thought about these Psalms. The Psalms shaped Israel's vision of God, of the world, of their place in the world, of who are the poor, who are the wicked, who are the wise. The Psalms drove the imagination of Israel, and it's no different with Mary. So when Mary talks about magnifying God and the humble, she is, she is probably thinking of Psalm chapter 34, verse 1, that says of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and went away. That's the heading. Verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. So it's interesting. Again, because David is writing these psalms. It's not like he's predicting that Jesus will come. This is not about me. This is about Jesus. No, he's writing his experience. But the gospel writers now, they're writing in such a way that now the, his, their hearers, their readers are, are, are sort of making the connections and looking back and seeing that all of these things that were written there had a greater fulfillment. That they pointed toward a different time when these texts would expand now and illuminate that which God was doing in Jesus and in Mary. So Mary makes the connection. You have done these things in the past, my Lord, and now I magnify you because you're doing them again. So yeah, text also, also talks about mercy for generations, right? 
Verse 50, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. A probable allusion to Psalm 103, and obviously other portions of Torah as well, but I just wanted to focus on the Psalms here. Psalm 103, verse 17 and 18. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember to do His commandments. So again, Mary is drawing from the richness of these psalms as she praises God in her prayer. And also, the Lord God fills the hungry with good things. We find that in Psalm 107. Just flip a few pages for those who are following along. 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Verse 8, Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of men, for He satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul He fills with good things. So again, Mary is drawing from all of these things that God has done in the past with Israel from even before Israel was Israel in Genesis to Abraham and then into Israel in Exodus and onward through the desert. She is drawing from these beautiful texts and imageries to praise God in her prayer. But, now, my favorite allusion in this prayer is an even more impactful allusion, a closer allusion, just because it's an illusion that brings in a story that is very similar to what Mary is experiencing herself. And that story is found in the book of 1 Samuel. To give you a little context, 1 Samuel is the story of the beginning of the monarchy. When Israel is going to have you know, the first king, Saul and then David. And you know the story, right? So basically before the book of Saul we have Ruth. And that's another beautiful story where we know sort of the lineage of, of David, where it comes from and, and how God treats the foreigners, those who are not part of Israel. Beautiful book, Ruth. But just remember that the context behind 1 Samuel is also the book of Judges, where the book that ends with the people had no king and they did whatever they thought was best. They couldn't care less for God or for anybody. So Israel is going down a very dark and complicated path or situation, process, path. And First Samuel begins with a story of hope. It's my favorite connection in this prayer. And the prayer of Mary is connected to the prayer of Hannah that appears in the first chapter of Samuel, chapter 2. First book of Samuel, chapter 2, that says, Hannah prayed, my heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth derives my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like God. And then on verse 4, she says, The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out of bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. So you can see the several connections there. Now, the story of Hannah in the beginning of the book of Samuel is quite interesting because she was also sort of unable to have children. And like Elizabeth and Mary, that puts her sort of in continuity with what is happening in the beginning of the gospel of Luke, but let me explain something even more interesting. After the book of Judges, like I said, Israel had no king. The priesthood, the spiritual leaders were abusing the people. It was very complicated. They functioned like kings themselves, like through the principles of empire, taking over, exploiting people. And this is sort of where 1 Samuel begins. And if you consider what is happening, you would expect the book of 1 Samuel to begin with a powerful vision from God about the newness that is to come, about a king that is coming. The book doesn't begin with God coming to a household and saying, Behold, I have chosen a king for Israel. It doesn't begin like that. It's a very anticlimactic beginning if you go back and read 1 Samuel chapter 1. The story begins with a little family. And their problems and little intrigues. And there is a reason this little family, the story begins with this little family, because this little family is a little example, is a miniature of what is happening with Israel. So yeah, let me just read the beginning of 1 Samuel to you. 
since we're not in a hurry here in this YouTube age. 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man on Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and in an Ephratite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from, sit, from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts of Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So yeah... After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant fight favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer said. So yes, they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked him from the Lord. So there you go. That's the story. And then you're asking yourself, okay, so what's the point? Why are we reading this whole story? What's the point of connecting this to Mary? Well, because the prayer of Mary is very similar to the prayer of Hannah. And we're not doing, you know, our job here is not to say, oh, look how great there's a connection in the Old Testament and here. So now let's move forward and pray and, and go on our date. No. There is more to it. It's not just that they're praying in similar ways. It's interesting that in this story here, what is actually happening in the story of Samuel and Hannah, that's right, Hannah. In the story of Hannah, it, it, it's much closer when we understand the context. That's why I read the whole thing to you. Why does the book of 1 Samuel begin with this little story that has, seems to have nothing to do with anything? Because this little family is a miniature of Israel, like I said. The closed womb of Hannah symbolizes the infruit, unfruitfulness of Israel. That there's nothing new. That they're bound for death. No life. Like in so many other stories of the Old Testament, where women could not have children. The, the barrenness is a symbol for something. So yes, the barrenness of Anna, like that of Elizabeth and Mary, are symbols of the barrenness of Israel, of the seemingly absence and silence of God. And God's intervention in the story of Hannah, Elizabeth, and now Mary, is a sign that God is still working in history, that Israel has not been forgotten, that their children will play a key role in the continuation of the people of God on earth and of the story of God on earth. 
So yes, Samuel becomes a key figure in this story. Later, David becomes a key figure. And now Mary with Jesus and Elizabeth with John also have children who will become key figures. But obviously, in the context of Mary, we're not just talking just about another Samuel or another prophet. We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God. The faithfulness of God has been proven. God is not absent. God is not silent. Everything He promised to do in all of these Psalms, in all the works of the prophets and Moses, will come into fruition through Jesus. God is faithful. He has not forgotten. And all this barren situation are just opportunities for God to prove again that He has not forgotten His children. So this brings me to the assumption number three. When we pray, it's not only about knowing that God is already at work. When we pray, it's not only about allowing God's Word to be fruitful within us as we respond. The third assumption is knowing that in prayer, we understand. We claim the promises because we know that God is faithful to do what He promised. One of the most important assumptions in prayer is just that one. The realization that God is faithful to do what God has promised. All of what I've been talking about thus far, here in the story of Hannah and now Mary, it all boils down to this one of the most important truths of the Bible. Faith in God, my friends, is faith that God will be faithful to do what He promised. A life of righteousness, of right standing with God, is not about my faithfulness as a demonstration, but my dependence on the faithfulness of God. When we pray, we're not showboating how faithful we are. No, we are relying on the one who is truly faithful, because we're not. So yes, faith in God is faith that God is faithful to do what He, has, he promised. To live in faith is to be ever reminder of what God has done in the past, what He has promised to do, and to live within the assurance that He will be faithful as we move forward to do what He promised to do. And the greatest sign, obviously, and we've talked about this in the series of Matthew, the greatest sign that God is faithful is Jesus. This is why Paul calls Jesus the righteousness of God. He is the utmost example that God is faithful to do what He has promised throughout the entire Bible. So when we pray, this is one of the main assumptions. God is faithful to do what He promised. So we remember what He has done and live in the expectation of new action in continuity with what He has done in the past. This is why when Mary prays, she is not only quoting Psalms, but she finds something similar in her experience to that of Hannah. And just like Israel was barren and seemed to be abandoned back then, so it is at the time of Mary. And she makes the connection. And now that God has spoken to her, now that she has given permission, her second prayer comes out as a celebration that God is still faithful. And he is still doing what he has promised to do. Amazing. So yeah, my friends, it's not about us. It's not about our faithfulness. It's hard to understand that. Especially within a, 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 a tradition that emphasizes that those who are truly good in the eyes of God are those who live by their faithfulness to laws. Or by their obedience to whatever. Missing the whole point of the entire biblical story, that it has never been about me and you. It was never about you or me. It's always been about the faithfulness of God that is now revealed in Jesus, who will be faithful to the point of death. The story is about God. And now God, through Jesus, Mary, is going to do a new thing. So when we pray, again, we need to be reminded our prayers need to be in continuity with the Word of God that keeps us always sensitive to the work of God in the past. So here again we see that proximity between Word, reading, and praying, and living. Why? Because as we read, we are reminded of what God has done in the past so that now through the work of the Spirit we might have insight as to what He is doing 
and what he will do again. So yes, assumption number three, God is faithful. In prayer, we remind ourselves of what God has done and what he will do. Which brings me to assumption number four. While there is a sense of continuity in prayer, what he has done and what he will do, that God will repeat what he has done in the past and the present, the way God does things brings newness. So there is continuity. Yes, God will do what He normally does. But in that doing, there will always be an opening for something new. Not because God has changed, but because we have all changed in our circumstances. Are radically different from that of Hannah or Mary. We live in a different time. So yes, we can rely on God to do things as He has done in the past. But that doing will probably take a different shape because our circumstances have changed. So when we look back, recognizing that God is faithful, we are still open to seeing Him act in a new way. With a fresh, new set of actions applicable to our context. So yeah, God's actions always bring with it a revolution. And we've seen that in the prayer of Mary. It's actually interesting that she's not just praying, oh Lord, thank you because you gave me now the opportunity to be blessed with something that will bless so many people. I, I promise I'm going to be faithful to you. I will do all these things. Because obviously when we pray, it's always about us. Mary doesn't pray like that. Just notice what she says. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those in humble state and filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent away empty. Our temptation here is just to think that this is a spiritual, oh, those who the Satan sits on the throne. This is not about Satan only, friends. This is about the powers that rule the world. Mary's prayer is not only thinking about, oh, how good it is to have Jesus. She understands that now that God is, is doing something through her, that will have an effect on everything. On Rome that is still oppressing Israel. On all those teachers that are confusing everybody with different doctrines and ways of seeing the world. The proud will go down. The rich will go away empty. Something will happen in reality because when God acts, revolution follows. So yes, there's continuity, but there's newness. And newness is revolution. And that is assumption number four. Don't think that when you pray it's over. Oh, thank you. Now I have a checklist in heaven and my name is still on whatever book is happening. No. When we pray, things will happen. In reality. And we need to understand that. It's not about me and you. When we pray, we have one eye in the faithfulness of God in the work of the past and the other on how that faithfulness will play out outside of us in the world where we are inserted. So yes, prayer is the expectation of revolution. It is living with eyes open to inhumanity. It is living as the embodiment of that Word of God that brings down the power structures that still oppress people today. All over. In the prayer of Mary, we learn that God establishes His strength and disestablishes the proud, that God puts down those at the top and lifts up those at the bottom, fills the hungry with the good things, and sends the rich away empty. Notice this prayer. This prayer needs to help us in our prayers. That it's not about our spiritual life and making the day, the prayers quota that God expects. No, when we pray, we are keeping our eye on the injustices around us. That if truly the Word of God now is embodied in us, that this Word, that God will do something through us in the world. So when we pray in this expectation of revolution, it's not that we sit back now. No, we need to understand that if God is working through us, if God is doing something new through those who are willing, giving permission to His doing, then we are to become answered prayers ourselves. Yes, sometimes we can't do anything. For Martha with cancer, for so many others with COVID in the hospitals doing not well, I cannot do anything apart 
from relying on God and His mercy to perform a miracle that I'm not able to. But there are a million other things that I can do. Yes, I can. And you can too. If this prayer highlights the work of God in the world, that it is to help those who are at the bottom, experiencing injustices in the workplace, I can become an answer prayer to that. If that is found within my sphere of action. If they are hungry in our midst, I can become an answered prayer to that as well. It's not just, Lord, bless the poor in our community. No, Lord, bless the poor. Bless me as I feed those who are in need. When we pray, keeping in mind that God is faithful, we will always be open to the the reality that this faithfulness brings newness and revolution and that we are part of that process. The Word of God embodied in us will flourish and will put down that which Mary's prayer delineates here. So yes, assumption three, God is faithful. Assumption four, that faithfulness leads to new action and revolution and we have a part in it. To speak for those who are voiceless. To help those who are helpless. That is the work of the body of Christ, the community of faith not only about throwing words up into heaven. It's reading, learning, listening to the Word and discerning what God is doing in the world and our part in that work as well as we become answered prayers. So yes, assumption for prayer is revolution. God is faithful. His actions on earth are revolutionary. The voices in the life of the disciples of Jesus will always be in continuity with what God promised to do. So prayer is the recognition that God is faithful and the realization that if He works through us, revolution is coming for the little ones, for the proud, the arrogant, and the rich. And the teachings of Jesus that we've been studying in Matthew now teach us how to go about doing just that. It's not going out in violence and kicking people, no. It's about being peacemakers. It's about developing a hunger and a thirst for a special kind of righteousness. It's about crying with those who are mourning. It's about developing poverty of spirit. It's about being persecuted for the sake of righteousness and the kingdom. Yes, that is how we embody the Word of God, the life of Jesus in us, so that we might prove to the world that God is faithful through Jesus who works in and through us and our community, as we serve and do the things that Jesus taught us to do. So yes, my friends, prayer is dependence on the faithfulness of God, always being mindful of what He has done in the past so that we might know what He is doing in the present as well. And yes, Prayer is revolution because every time God sets His way, His plan into action, revolution happens. Nothing remains the same. So yeah, it's like having children. You plan on it. You know normally what happens from your past experiences. But then when the kids come out, run and and destroy things, you're like, well, this is new, and it's amazing. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, um, my grandfather, who now is deceased, he had a house, and he just painted one of the doors with some chemical thing, and, and at that time, we were playing with matches and fire. That was the thing we did when we were on vacation at his house. We played with fire, put fires everywhere. But we made a mistake one day of... of, of uh, of setting fire close to the door that he recently pa- painted. And to make a long story short, basically the, the door caught on fire. And, and basically we all started running to the kitchen with, to pick up glasses of water to throw it on the fire and to try to put it out. Remember my brother, he, he picked up something that was uh, you know, clear. He thought it was water. When he threw it, it was you know, cleaning supplies that just made the fire even bigger. So it was truly a dangerous thing. My grandfather just came out of the house and just witnessed this whole thing. And I don't know what he went through his mind, but when I think about it, I mean, you know, you have your children, and then your children have children. And, and, and then he looks at this, and, and yes, he's mad. We got, we, we, we got punished later. But, 
but I, I think for one second there he was amazed, just I am as when my children do something crazy. It's like, wow. You know, you, you know you're going to have children, grandchildren, but wow. So yes, when we pray, my friends, there is also a sense of security, of safety, of knowing that God is going to do something, but to be open to that fire, to that newness, to that unexpectedness is a powerful thing. God can do amazing things still because He is faithful. And through Jesus and the faithfulness of Jesus, He is binding our community together to do even greater works than those that Jesus revealed to us. So yes, may God continue blessing us as we pray together before the coming year because this is what prayer looks like in real life. God is faithful and He is bringing new revolutions each day through those who are willing to say, let it be done according to me, according to your word, let it be done to me. So today, let's pray together as we close. Dear God, we magnify your name because you are faithful. You are good and you are still at work. Although our world, our country, our cities, our families might look barren and hopeless, you are the God who brings new life. And as you bring new life, you will put down those in power who oppress others. You will raise the humble. You will feed the hungry. And you will send the arrogant and the rich, those who trust in riches, away empty. So keep doing that work and may we become answered prayers as we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll see you next week, my friends. Be blessed, and above all things, be kind.